This video is sponsored by Audible. Use my link, audible.com slash the dom, or text the dom to 500, 500 to get a free book, two free Audible originals, and a 30 day free trial. Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the YouTube review show that compares film adaptations to the books they're based on to see how loyally they were converted from page to screen. Got a doozy for you guys today, even people who have never seen the 1972 adaptation of A Clockwork Orange probably know of it by reputation. It remains to this day one of the most controversial films ever made. There are countless news articles and reports from the 70s blaming this film for inspiring real life crimes. The director, Stanley Kubrick, who I'm sure most of you will be familiar with due to his resume, May, received multiple death threats against him and his family for having dared to make something so horrible. But before we discuss that, let's talk about the inspiration for it. Anthony Burgess, like all the coolest people, hailed from Great Britain. He considered himself as much of a music composer as a writer, though he never found as much success with the former as the latter. He wrote several books, though A Clockwork Orange was by far the most famous, and probably not coincidentally, the darkest of his books. Before we go any further, please take a moment to listen to this mother of all trigger warnings. While I will of course not be showing the worst scenes on screen, the story under discussion in today's episode involves a massive amount of torture, violence, and sexual assault, and worse, these acts are sadistically and remorselessly perpetrated by the narrator and main character, the person we are instinctively predispositioned to root for as the reader and audience. If hearing about any of these things being described or discussed is something that will adversely affect your state of mind, you are highly advised to avoid this video, as it is going to come up a lot. It's super integral to the plots of both the book and the film. Oh, and if if you're one of those people who feels the need to complain about trigger warnings, you are cordially invited to fuck off. These are real things used in the medical community to avoid further exacerbating people who have suffered traumatic events in their lives. You are being an ignorant prick, and I don't want you enjoying my reviews, so... <laughs> jog on. So, as I was saying, A Clockwork Orange, released in 1962, is actually a bit out of keeping with Burgess's usual writing style, and unfortunately, like the plot of the book, the backstory behind its creation is a tad dark. I don't want to go into too much detail, as this is real life stuff, not fiction, but Burgess and his wife are on the receiving end of some violent crime themselves, and it looks like it took a toll on his worldview for a while. As usual, before discussing the adaptation, let's quickly go over the book and the film as individuals. Just in case you're completely unfamiliar, with this book, it's formatted as if it's been written, not by Burgess, but by the main character, Alex DeLarge, jotting down a memoir of a very eventful few years of his young life, and he does so in the same vernacular in which he speaks, that is to say, the fictional language of Nadsat. Nadsat is mostly English, but spoken in a more poetic format than average, and with many words replaced, mostly with a bastardized form of Russian, but also with some Cockney rhyming slang, some regular English slang, and the occasional pure gibberish. Just as an example, uh... Hi 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 there, my beauteous watchers. It seems that Starry Cubic got his rookers on another book and told the author to lubber dub his sharries because he always has his own meshels and how to do veshies and yubbles to you if you don't like it. Burgess has since admitted that he did this to lessen the blow for the audience while they read about the horrific things going on in the book, and I can kind of see what he means. It does create a certain disconnect. It is less jarring to read, and then oh my brothers, we had at her with the old ultra violence until the crewy flowed freely, and one by one we took a spell with the old in out in out than, and then we beat a woman until she was bleeding really badly before gang raping her. Strictly from a literary perspective, the book is pretty good in my opinion. It's cohesive, engaging, and I have to say the Nadsat is fascinating to listen to. Obviously the main drawback of it is how intentionally horrible the story is, but it at least makes me very curious to read Burgess's other, less edgy books sometime. Burgess himself professed a certain dissatisfaction with A Clockwork Orange, and a deep unhappiness that it was what he was primarily known for. He claimed that he wrote it in under three weeks, and it was definitely not his best work, but thanks to Kubik and the film, it would forever be his bestseller and his legacy. I can personally relate to this, seeing as a filler episode that I did just to get some angry thoughts off my chest looks like it will forever be my most watched video on YouTube. The original working title of the book was apparently The Plank in Your Eye, a reference to a passage from the New Testament. The final title, A Clockwork Orange, comes from an obscure and mostly forgotten Cockney phrase, as queer as a clockwork orange. Uh, that's queer as in strange, and the fact that it makes absolutely no sense for a piece of fruit to run on clockwork is pretty much the point of the sentence, so it basically translates to, that's really weird. Trust me, this is not the most confusing phrase to come out of East London. Cockneys have an entire rhyming slang based around using words that don't rhyme. Anyway, should we have a butchers of that film then? It's hard to describe A Clockwork Orange the film to those who haven't seen it. A simple rundown of the plot simply doesn't do it justice. I'm personally super conflicted about it on almost every level. I think partly because I managed to get two degrees in filmmaking and still be a bit of a 
basic bitch in regards to what I like in them. On one hand, it is a masterpiece of filmmaking, with every sound, image, pan, tilt, transition and cut telling a story in ways you didn't even know it could be told, but on the other hand, what the fuck even is this movie? There are multiple minutes long scenes, they're just people signing documents, hurry the fuck up Kubrick, I've got shit to do today! Then of course there's my dislike of using shock and sensationalism just for the sake of it, but then again that's not exactly what this film is doing, it is using these things to force people to confront the horrors mankind is capable of, both in the form of crime and the government response to it, but then again and again, good lord there's a limit to doing that in good taste and this film exceeds it and then some, but then again 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 would anyone even remember this film if it hadn't been so distasteful? I, I don't know what I want from you Kubik, I'm sorry. Far better film critics have broken this down more effectively than I ever could, so I guess I'll restrict myself to saying it is good, but most certainly not for everyone. Before we jump into the main review, there's an unusual extenuating circumstance regarding this adaptation I have to make you aware of. A Clockwork Orange is 21 chapters long in every country except America. The publisher that released the book in the US insisted that the last chapter be taken out before they would accept it, describing said chapter as a sellout, bland, and very, very British. And what with Americans being made of sterner stuff, taking the chapter out guaranteed better sales via sensationalism. When Stanley Kubrick made his film, he adapted the American version of the book, so the original conclusion to the story was never even considered for it, and trust me, it's a game changer. So yes, regardless of whatever else might come up in this review, I guess I won't be able to say that the film is a disloyal adaptation because the ending is different, because the changing of took place before the film was even a gleam in the eye of Stan the Man Kubrick. That said, obviously I'm still going to discuss it when we get to the right segment. First though... <laughs> The four of them, that is to say, Alex DeLarge, the book's narrator, and his three droogs, that being the NADSAT word for gang members, Brother Georgie, Brother Pete, and Brother Dim, starting off an evening in a club that sells milk spiked with various hallucinogenic or stimulant drugs, heading out afterwards to beat the piss out of some unlucky victims, including an intoxicated homeless man who, to his credit, showed a lot of defiance to their bullying, interrupting a larger street gang that was about to sexually assault someone, and winning the fight before fleeing the area before the police can arrive, stealing a car and going for a joy ride out into the countryside, approaching a house which for some reason is called home, and convincing the woman who lives there to open the door by pretending that they were some passing travellers, one of whom is in need of medical attention, badly beating the woman's husband, a writer by the name of F. Alexander, and gang raping her before wrecking the house, going back to the milk bar for a nightcap, and witnessing a woman burst into a brief opera song. Dim mocking this, enraging Alex, and almost resulting in an altercation between the two before Dim backs down, Alex going home and blasting out some of his beloved classical music before going to sleep. Alex faking illness to avoid school the next day, and receiving an unexpected visit from Mr. Deltoid, his post-corrective advisor, basically a parole officer for minors, who threatens him to stay on the straight and narrow or he'll be in deep doo-doo, Alex heading to the record store to collect his copy of Beethoven's Ninth, meeting two girls there, and taking them back to his place for some sexual activity. I'm going to have to swing back to this bit though, because there are several horrifying differences in this scene in the book that we will need to discuss. His droogs waiting for him in his building's lobby, Georgie and Dim attempting to muscle in a hostile takeover of the gang, but Alex putting them in their place with a vicious assault and knife injuries, the four of them then going off to rob an isolated lady with a house full of cats and expensive things for the stealing, but Alex getting carried away attempting to overpower her and killing her instead, Dim betraying Alex by blinding him and leaving him behind to be picked up by the police. Alex getting roughed up by the police and spat on by a disgusted Mr. Deltoid as he is informed that he is a murderer now, an off-page slash screen trial resulting in a 14 year sentence, Alex surviving in prison by sucking up to the chaplain, reading the bible, and fantasizing about taking part in the gorier stories, mostly the old testament stuff, but also envisioning taking part in the torture and crucifixion of christ, Alex hearing about the possibility of volunteering for a new medical technique that could get him out of prison immediately, and ignoring the chaplain's warnings against it, the minister for the interior, a big deal in the British government coming to the prison and selecting Alex to be the first test subject for his new criminal reformation experiment, Alex being moved out of prison into a medical facility where he's given injections to make him feel horrifically sick while being forced to watch violent movies to condition him to associate crime with crippling illness, Alex suddenly noticing that they're playing his beloved Beethoven in the background during his treatments, and being horrified that he's being inadvertently indoctrinated against his favourite composer as well, his objections being of course completely ignored by his doctors. After a fortnight of this, 
this, the scientists in charge of the experiment putting on a performance to show off the results. Subjecting Alex first to an attack and then the opportunity to take advantage of a woman, both of which prove he can't even think about violence without his body reacting to it and incapacitating him. The chaplain's objections on the grounds that conditioned goodness is not true goodness. Choice is an important theme to Burgess, remember that. A now free Alex returning home to find that his parents have rented out his room to another man and, to be completely honest, understandably don't want him living with them again. A lost and alone Alex getting recognised by a former victim of his and being attacked by a large group of the elderly. The beating getting broken up by two policemen, one of whom, against all logical expectations, turns out to be dim, for it seems that while Alex was in prison, the government started hiring the most violent thugs they could find to be in law enforcement. His former droog dragging him out to the countryside for an even more violent beating. In his delirious state, Alex stumbling once again to the home home, the dwelling of yet another former victim. Mr. F. Alexander, the writer he so wronged, recognising him, not for being his tormentor, for Alex wore a mask back in the day, but because he'd read about his experimental conditioning in the paper. Offering him hospitality, partly out of sympathy, but also because he wants to use him and his story as a way to weaken the government that he despises in the build-up to the general election. Alex learning that the woman he raped died a few months later of illness, and her widower blames her death on the trauma she suffered, revealing himself to have gone quite, quite mad since the last time he and Alex met. His host eventually realising that he and his new ward have met before, though not letting on right away. Some activist friends of Mr. Alexander's turning up to hear Alex's story, and after he reveals to them that he was inadvertently conditioned to react to classical music as well as violence, they lock him in a room and belt out a good symphony to drive him into committing suicide by throwing himself out of a window. Surviving against all odds, Alex is visited in the hospital by his parents, who apologise for abandoning him and invite him to move back in with them. He's also approached by the Minister of the Interior, who tells him that his attempted suicide had revealed the inhumanity of his reconditioning and badly hurt the government's chances of re-election, just like Mr. Alexander and his friends had planned. He bribes Alex with various things like a high-paying job of his choosing and the incarceration of Mr. Alexander to play nice and help win back public approval. As part of this, Alex would also be cured of what was done to him. Alex is cured, alright, free to go back to all the rape and violent attacks he could ever want. In addition to a rigid adherence to almost every beat of the plot, Kubrick also went out of his way to recreate many of the book's details in his film. Alex's casual dominance over his parents, the graffiti paintings in his building, the doors to the lift having been all bent out of shape requiring the use of the stairs, Mr. Deltoid's habit of ending every other sentence with an elongated yes, and Alex's prison number 6655321. The film also includes the constant background hints that the British government of the story is on the verge of going full authoritarian, hiring thugs to be policemen, and the comments from the politicians that they need to free up some prison space from regular criminals to make room for the rush of political offenders they expect soon. For the most part, the NADSAT used in the film mirrors the bizarre half-language of the book very closely. Alex's voiceover is mostly lifted from the book word for word, including his occasional habit of addressing the audience as his only friends, and referring to himself as your humble narrator. It appears that I was completely wrong in my expectations of Kubrick and his intentions towards this book. Having reviewed The Shining, I just assumed that he would treat this adaptation in a way similar to what pissed Stephen King off so much, but no, the loyalty segment of this review runneth over as you can see. Behind the scenes stories about this film's production claim that Kubrick sometimes forsook a shooting script altogether and came bearing a copy of the book to set each day. It apparently took some convincing to get him to agree to make this film, but once he did, he apparently went all in on the adaptation side of things. Though of course, before passing final judgement, we must first discuss... While the bizarre but iconic getup of the film that inspired so much cosplay over the years was reminiscent of the fashion of the book, it's not exactly right. Their tights were supposed to be black, and they wore novelty cod pieces of various outlandish designs. Oh yes, very nice. The costume of the film was apparently part improvised by Malcolm McDowell, the actor playing Alex, who incorporated some of his personal cricket sporting attire into his clothing. The elderly victim who summoned his friends to try to exact geriatric revenge on Alex while he was fresh out of prison wasn't the unlucky hobo in the book, but an elderly gentleman caught out after dark trying to take some books home from the library that the boys tormented for the sadistic pleasure of it. The masks worn by the droogs to hide their identities were originally full head covering rubber masks of famous historical figures, similar to the presidential masks worn in Point Break, but of former Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, Elvis Presley, King Henry VIII, and P.B. Shelley. So here's a dark subject, and I would like to quickly double down on that trigger warning from earlier before going into it. It seems there was one thing from the book that was too much even for the master of making people face 
and deal with the shock factor Stanley Kubrick, and that was the age of most of the characters. Not only did he hire a man in his late twenties to play 15 year old Alex DeLarge, he also upped the age of his sexual partners. Let's just get this out there, the two girls that in the film Alex impressed and took home to have a hilariously fast cranked threesome with while a synthesized cover of Beethoven blasted out in the background were ten years old, and it was not a consensual encounter. He drugged and violently raped both of them. The murder weapon, which as you can see is a uh, big marble penis in the film, was a silver bust of Beethoven in the book, an extra callback to the composer that Alex was so obsessed with and his fate so entwined with. A minor but confusing change is that instead of being picked by the minister because he was ballsy enough to give him lip, he was chosen for shouting some boot-licking ass kissery and trying to downplay the horror of the crime he committed. As the minister was looking for the worst, most horribly violent person he could find to test his science on, I'm not sure why he'd select a lick spittle for his first subject. So confident in the success of their conditioning with the scientists of the book, they returned Alex's knife to him before putting him on stage to be bashed and bullied. Basil the Snake and the Dancing Messiahs are a visual added by Kubrick with no basis that I could see in the novel. The second policeman with Dim, Georgie in the film, was in fact Billy Boy, the rival gang leader in the book. He and Dim apparently having put their differences aside and joined the Metropolitan together. Georgie Boy's fate was a tad darker in the book. Not long into his prison sentence, Alex was informed that his former Drew had been killed when a man whose home he had invaded smashed his head in with a fire poker in what was generally agreed to have been an overzealous but completely justified act of self-defense. Singing in the rain, the joyful melody that Alex performs in the film while so cruelly beating Mr. Alexander, and the foolish repetition of later being what gave away his true identity, is another film-only addition and, apparently, another Malcolm McDowell improvisation. In the book, Alex's constant use of NADSAT and a mention of the word DIM eventually gave away his secret to the political writer he was now at the mercy of. Darkly, it's implied that none of his friends believed him, meaning that they were already planning on killing Alex regardless to further their political agenda. Mr. F. Alexander himself and his wife were both younger in the book. He managed to survive his beating without being confined to a wheelchair, and his muscular young carer is a film original too. FYI, that is Darth Vader himself, David Prowse, carrying McDowell like a babe in his arms. Adaptation-wise, it seems that Stanny Boy Kubrick is still on a roll, as I consider everything I just mentioned pretty much cosmetic as changes go. They certainly don't appear to impact the plot or meaning of the book's story in any significant way. Right, right? Right, right. Right, right. There's a few other cosmetic things left out of the story, more crimes committed at the beginning for example, and some old ladies the lads often bought food and drink for in exchange for providing them with alibis when the police came around looking for culprits. An interesting thing that Kubrick cut out of the story was any and every reference to its title. As I mentioned, it's based on a long forgotten London saying, but it's also title dropped in the book several times. The manuscript that Mr. Alexander was working on when they broke into his home was a political and sociological commentary tentatively titled A Clockwork Orange. Alex took offence to the bizarrety of the title and ripped it to shreds, however the name stuck with him. When the intellectuals, philosophers and politicians were arguing over the ethical implications of his treatment, Alex couldn't stop himself from demanding to know what was to become of him, and screaming, am I to be a clockwork orange, without really understanding the full meaning of his words on a conscious level. Later, when Mr. Alexander takes him in, Alex sees that he rewrote and published his work, making A Clockwork Orange a book within a book. Before things get all horrific with the ten-year-olds that Alex abuses, we learn that even though there's only a five-year age gap between them, the girl spoke a completely new and different form of NADSAT to him, one that he viewed with ironic disdain and condescension. There's a missing story from within prison where a new cellmate is introduced to Alex's already dangerously overcrowded cell, he tries to make a move on the teenager, and all four occupants beat the new guy to death. The other three universally decided to blame the whole thing on Alex, which is another factor in why he was selected for the reconditioning experiment. I don't want to go into too much NADSAT related nitpicking, but one phrase, horror show, used to mean good, or sometimes for emphasis, like great big, comes up a lot in the book but seems to have utterly failed to transition into the film script. Joe, the DeLarge's lodger, fell afoul of some British police in the end of the book. He apparently showed them some minor rudeness, so they beat him so badly he had to move back home to recover, freeing up Alex's room for his return. Okay, I think it's about time I pay off the setup I laid down at the start of this. What was in that 21st chapter that the Americans were so convinced would ruin the whole story? I'm not gonna lie, I'm kind of excited to drop this 
particular truth bomb. After being quote unquote cured of his indoctrination, Alex recruits a new set of droogies and tries to return to his life of crime, but quickly finds the life of sadistic hedonism has lost all its flavour for him. He genuinely no longer enjoys the ultra violence the way he did before and has these new confusing urges to save his money and not be a dickhead all the time. This is intensely exacerbated by a chance encounter with his former droog Pete, who at age 20 has given up the life of crime, gotten a job, married a rather nice girl and now attends pleasant wine parties with his friends on the weekends. He's also completely given up NADSAT, so it's the most fucking hilarious conversation of the whole book. Have I gone bazoomly? Married? What chapuka? A grassy trick for sure. Surely you're too Molojoy to be married, Bratty Pete. What dinner crumb legend is such a thing? Well, you know, when you meet the right person, why wait? You're having a gaff, a horror show smack at that. My mozzle can't handle it. You know, it really is quite nice having a quiet life. My job isn't anything special right now, but it's a good start, and I have big plans for the future. Well, bugger me. That was horror show good time videoing you, my starry droogie. Yes, it was lovely seeing you too, Alex. We really must have you around for wine tasting sometime. After this meeting, Alex decides to follow suit. He chooses to make it his mission to find a nice woman to settle down with and have children that he can teach not to lead the same life that he did, slightly pessimistically thinking that they would probably ignore him like he ignored his parents, but deciding to try nonetheless. Burgess refers to this as the redemption chapter, but I mean, it's not really, is it? Redemption implies Alex is going to do something to try to atone for his crimes, but all he's really doing is deciding not to commit anymore because it's no longer fun. He claimed that Alex came to view his evil past of shame, but that's some JK Rowling level, well you should have put that in the book then, crap as far as I'm concerned. However, chapter 21 still redefines the whole damn story. Now everything that came before becomes the setup to the final message, that even the worst human being imaginable is capable of change, of growing up, of being better. It's not inevitable, but it's possible. A Clockwork Orange the book ended not on the shocking twist that unrepentant evil won the day, but on a note of optimism for the fundamental nature of humanity. I have to wonder how much Kubrick knew about this. I mean, he must have known that the copy he had was the abridged version of the book, right? Right? Legit question, I can't seem to find an answer online. Anyways, now that that's out there, I guess the real question is, and I usually try to avoid this on Lost in Adaptation because this is supposed to be a show about judging loyalty, not merit, but... Which is better? You see, as condescending and nationalist as the book's American publisher allegedly was, he wasn't wrong. The story concluding with no spark of hope for mankind does make for a more sensationalist and shocking experience. It's entirely possible that if the film had ended in the same way as the British book, it wouldn't have become the legendary hit that it was. On the other hand though, it might have saved poor Kubrick all those nasty death threats. It's the belief of Burgess and many others that without the final chapter, the American publication, and by extension the film, changes the message of the story to a straight up dangerous glorification of the most heinous crimes imaginable. Even if you don't agree with that, without the final chapter of the book, the shock and horror of the story is just shock and horror. It's not building up to anything besides making the audience sick to their stomach when they realise that a small part of them has been hoping for a happy ending for the vicious bastard they couldn't help but care about just a little bit because that's just what you do with a story's main character. Final thoughts. Regardless of whatever conclusions each of us might come to in regards to which version of the book is superior, it cannot be denied that the film is a shockingly good on-screen recreation of the version of the book it adapted. It looks like Kubrick's mission was to make as shocking a film as possible, and he chose the right story for it, which would explain why he didn't feel the need to change it in any way, and might be why he chose the American version of the book to adapt. I suspect that even if Burgess hadn't come to view his own book of such apathy, he still would have disliked this film, simply because of the ending, which not only changes his message, but must have been an everlasting reminder of a decision forced on him at a time when he lacked sufficient influence to stand up for himself. But honestly, that's between Burgess and Kubrick as far as I'm concerned. You would be well within your your rights to take issue with this film from a moral perspective, from a stylized filmmaking perspective, or from a just not your cup of tea perspective, but from an adaptation perspective, I don't see how you could have wanted more. Thank you for joining me, my beauteous watchers. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel from being told chocked by the YouTube algorithm, and if you feel the urge to recommend me to a droogie, do me a favor and don't spar it. Video you soon, brothers. Video you soon.
Before we part ways, my beautiful watchers, would you be so good as to stay a moment more so that I might gush to you about the many advantages of the colossal audiobook repository known as Audible. You can start listening right away with a 30-day Audible trial that comes with a free audiobook of your choice, plus two free Audible originals. There is no commitment and no obligation. You can end your subscription at any time, and you get to keep any audiobooks you've downloaded. Audible is a godsend if you have a long motor vehicle journey ahead of you, or perhaps you seek to better yourself through training and need a hands-free distraction while you do so, or you just want to super chill way to spend an evening. I've wished many times that something like Audible had been available to me when I was a wee super dyslexic nipper. So many more stories would have been available to me at a younger age, but I am super happy that the whippersnappers of today have access to it. If you're curious about A Clockwork Orange and would like to experience this story for yourself, it is available, and I have checked, the 21st chapter is included, so if you're a fan of this film, this might well be the perfect way to see how it could have ended. If you suspect that that story might be a tad too dark for you, and I completely understand if that is the case, the subject of the last episode, Burning Chrome by William Gibson, the collection audiobook that includes Johnny Mnemonic, is also available. Alternatively, if you'd like to get ahead of the game and listen to what I'll be reviewing in the next episode, you can do that too. It's, uh, an Amish romance novel. I have a good reason for reviewing it, I promise. So yeah, like I said, start listening with a 30-day Audible trial, and your first audiobook plus two Audible originals will be on the house. Visit audible.com slash the dom or text the dom to 500-500. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honour, Aaron G. Dunsill, Sasha I. Edwards, and Shelby Holtz. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dorm, I can't do that, for I have no money left after building a personal fortress to prepare for the coming zombie apocalypse. Do you have any idea how expensive a lifetime supply of food, water, and ammunition is? Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. And what with Americans being made of sterner, 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 I got that a tape got bit wound up there. Anthony Burgess, like all the coolest people, hailed from Great Britain. Great Britain! We come from Great Britain where things are very bad! <laughs> He considered himself as much of a music composer as a writer, though he never found as much success with the former as the latter. He Ah, oh, they're towing their car out of the car park. So sure glad two people's days are being ruined. Take a picture of my kitties. Oh, you're being so shit. Behind the. Ah, oh, I bit my tongue. Oh, that really hurt, motherfucker.